In the previous video, we looked at the odds of success in a control condition and the odds of success in a treatment condition. Those were two of the descriptive statistics that we could calculate. But there's another very useful descriptive statistic that combines these two statistics. This is called the odds ratio. The ratio of two odds for two conditions is known as the odds ratio. In the example we've been looking at, the odds of passing in the control group were 3 to 2. The odds of passing in the treatment group were 4 to 1. Let's look at the odds ratio, putting the odds of passing in the treatment in the numerator and the control in the denominator. This simplifies to 8 to 3 or 2.67. This tells us the odds of passing in the treatment condition is 2.67 times higher than in the control condition. Now imagine if the treatment had not changed anything. Then the odds of passing in the treatment condition would also be 3 to 2. And our odds ratio would have been 3 to 2 over 3 to 2 or 1. And we would say the odds of passing in the treatment condition is one times higher, meaning that it's no higher than in the control condition. So 1 becomes the baseline indicating that there is no effect of the treatment. We're used to, in many of the statistical analyses we looked at, as 0 as indicating no effect. But when you're dealing with odds, and more specifically the odds ratio, 1 indicates no effect. The odds ratio can be calculated from probabilities as well as from frequencies. The probability of passing when you're in the control to the probability of failing when you're in the control is 0.6 to 0.4. The probability of passing in the treatment compared to the probability of failing in the treatment is 0.8 to 0.2. If you put those in a ratio, you get the same value of 2.67. So whether you're using probabilities, proportions, frequencies, it does not matter. The important thing is that the odds ratio provides the effect of the treatment and does so by telling us how many times higher the odds are of passing in the treatment condition compared to the odds of passing in the control condition. Now at this point, we're going to take a little mathematical journey. This is math we're going to use when we get where we're going, but you really only need the result. I don't often invite you to sleep in my courses, but if you want to doze off a little bit, now's the time to do it. For some of you, you're going to be really interested in how we get from point A to point B, but others of you are only going to be interested in how we use this at the end. So if this is not your cup of tea, well then go get a cup of tea, and when you come back, I'll let you know when it's time to pay attention again. What do we get from this equation if we put in bigger and bigger values for x. That is 1 plus 1 over x all raised to the x power. Well, let's try it. Here I have set x equals to 1. Here's our equation. I'm going to go ahead and call this, uh, let's call it e. And let's see what we get when we put 1 in for x in this equation. So looking down here in the environment, we see that we get 2 for E. What about if we had put 2 in? Now we get 2.25. What about if we had put 3 in? Now we get 2.37. I could keep going and going, or let's let R do a bunch of these for us. How about we do everything 
from 1 to 1,000. Now let's see what we get. Well, you can see way up here at the top, we start it with 2, then 2.25, then 2.37. We had already done those. By the time we get down to 1,000, we get to 2.716924. What if I kept going? What if I kept going to 10,000 or to a million and so on? Well, we're not going to do that in R. Instead, I'm going to give you the answer. If we put in bigger and bigger values for X, we'll gradually approach a number and that number is called Euler's number and is denoted as a lowercase e. Just like the special number we know as pi, e has many practical uses. Here I'm showing you what e is equal to so many digits. Notice the ellipses at the end. Just like pi, it goes on and on and on, and there are people that have calculated this to thousands of digits, but no one has ever calculated it to the end because there is no end. How about we just call it 2.718, just like we call pi 3.14. Now let's talk about the logistic function. Again, some of our classmates have gone to make themselves some tea, and that's okay. They can miss this. I'm going to keep going. Let P be the probability of success. Let Q be the probability of failure, and P is related to Q by the formula Q equals 1 minus P. You either are successful or you fail, so you can relate those two together because the probability of success plus the probability of failure equals 1. We can express P as a function of two parameters and a known variable, x. You may guess, and you would be guessing correctly, that x is our explanatory variable. In the example we've been going through, x can be control or it can be treatment. So if we treat it as a dummy variable, the way we learned to do in the past, x could be 0 for the control and 1 for the treatment. The parameters are alpha and beta, or we could say beta 0 and beta 1. And in fact, when we add more known variables, that's exactly what we end up doing so that we can have beta 2, beta 3, and so forth. Sound familiar? We can calculate that probability of success based upon this function, 1 divided by this quantity, 1 plus E, Euler's number, raised to the negative quantity of alpha plus beta x. We know that x can be 0 or 1. The question is, what is alpha and what is beta? Ah, we have to estimate them just like we do in regular regression, where we estimate those parameters. We have to estimate them, but if we estimate them very well, we can actually get P, the probability of success. Now P, the left-hand side of the equation, looks a lot simpler than the right side of the equation. So why do we do all of this? Well, stick with me except for those who are getting their tea, or by now they're probably back drinking it, they can continue to read their book or scroll through a magazine. They don't need to pay attention yet. I'll let them know when. But let me tell the rest of you who are watching that this function in which we're using to define P in this peculiar fashion is known as the logistic function. Now another side trip, this one about logarithms. The logarithm, often we just say the log, is a mathematical function that is the inverse of exponents. Here's an example with base 
2. What power do we need to raise 2 to in order to get 8? Well, that's 3. 2 to the third equals 8. So what we say is log base 2 of 8 equals 3. If we take our base, which is 2, raise it to the answer here of 3, we get the 8. So it's the inverse of exponents. Here's another example using base e. e to the fourth is 54.6. So we would say that log base e of 54.6 is 4. When we use e as the base, we call it the natural log, and we abbreviate it like this, ln. So we can say ln 54.6, and anyone who has worked with natural logs knows we're talking about the natural log, and we don't need to write that little e down there. And the natural log of 54.6 is 4, meaning that Euler's number raised to the fourth power is 54.6. The logit of P is the natural log of the odds. So if I take P, the probability of success, in a ratio with the probability of failure, you know that as the odds, and then if I take the natural log of that, that is called the logit. The natural log of the odds P over Q can be mathematically rearranged to be the log of P minus the log of Q. Now let's continue working on this, except now let's substitute in our formula for P. Now we get that the log of P over Q is all of this stuff. Okay, cool. Why are we doing this? Keep watching. The log of P over Q is now simplified to this. I'm just taking mathematical steps. I'm not going to go any further than this, but those of you who want to take your time and work through each step that I have done, you'll see that all I'm doing is taking the natural log of a ratio, which is the same as subtracting the log of the denominator from the log of the numerator. Continuing on, I now arrive finally at this answer, that the log of the odds is equal to alpha plus beta x. Wait a minute, that looks familiar. Indeed it does. And now, those of you who are sleeping, wake up. If you're drinking your tea and reading your magazine, hey, over here, look, look. It's time to pay attention again. This is the equation of a regression line. Thus, we refer to this as logistic regression. It's regression using a logit. Look at the left side of this last equation, the natural log of the odds. Look at the right side, expressed as a function of two variables, alpha plus beta times x, where x is our explanatory variable. So we have two parameters. We could have written this beta 0 plus beta 1 times x. This looks very much like regression, except that the left-hand side of the equation is the natural log of the odds, and odds are what we use when we have a categorical response variable.